Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Resume Writing, How to Get Your Resume Notice. I'm Dr. Kerwin Rockefeller with the University of California, Irvine Extension. I'll be your moderator and host today. Uh, and please join me in welcoming our very special guest today, an alumni of UCI, Julie LaCroix. Uh, a couple of housekeeping issues first. I would like to do a sound audio check. So if you can hear me, just please uh, hit one of the little icons there. You may have a check mark. You may have a smiley face. There could be any number of things there. We just want to make sure. Here come some check marks. Great. Just want to make sure that you can hear us and everything and it's going very well. Well, I see some check marks and I see some hands being raised there. So thank you, everyone. So um, a quick note, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to you in 24 hours. Your email confirmation has instructions to access the recording link and the recording is active for seven calendar days. We're so pleased to be bringing this webinar to you today. This is a joint project between University of California Alumni Association the UC Irvine Career Center, and again, UC Irvine Extension. Another little helpful hint, we do have some didactic information we want to get across to you today, but we do also want to encourage your questions and your feedback. So you can write your questions in the chat box at any time during the presentation. Again, I'll be the moderator and I'll act as uh, sort of collecting questions as we go along. If you have a burning question, please go ahead and ask us and, and I'll moderate when I can actually get to our speaker here. But we will also have a specific Q&A session at the very end of our presentation. Before we go on, I'd like to ask one more polling question. I'll clear the icons right now. But um, I want to know how many of you, with a show of hands or a check mark, have had five years or more of work experience. That's five years or more of work experience. This will help us tailor. This will help us tailor our. Um, our presentation to you today. Right. So it looks like a lot of people have some experience here. Well, wonderful. Well, again, it is my pleasure to uh, host today and to bring you Julie LaCroix. And Julie, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Kerwin. It's Why nice don't to be here. you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brings you to our webinar today? Well, I'm thrilled to be here as um, part of your webinar series, and I'm thrilled about the, um, the cooperation or collaboration, if you will, between these three very important departments here at UCI. As a UCI alum, I was a, a student athlete, and I was on student council. I enjoyed being involved, and I um, moved on from UCI to uh, start a career on Wall Street, moved to New York, uh, learned a lot about trading and numbers, which was really different than my psych degree here at UCI and um, somehow got into the sales side of things, um, sold uh, during the electronic trading boom, which was really, really a great learning curve for me. Um, fell back in love with people who were working, so um, I started a recruiting business after that and uh, moved back here to California to build that. And then after working as a recruiter, I, I just realized that I wanted to get back to my psychology roots and work with individuals. So I went back to grad school and got my clinical training out of the way, and now I work in private practice as a career counselor with business experience, clinical experience, and of course my career development framework. Well, thanks for being here. Now, anxiety about resumes. Oh my goodness, I love your very first slide here. <laughs> Why do resumes give us so much anxiety? Let's start off with our webinar now. Well, I think that anxieties give us a lot of ang uh, uh, resumes give us a lot of anxiety. We we're so afraid of losing control. We're so afraid of. Oh, am I clicking it or are you? I'll, I'll go ahead. Thank you. Click. We're so afraid of losing control. That's that's my theory. I think we give up control to the reader when we submit a resume. It's in their hands as to whether or not they're going to look at us, and it's almost expected rejection to send a resume down a pipe. So the more your resume can be appealing and try to hook the interest of a reader, the more control that we actually have when we let go of our resume. Well, no one likes rejection. No. But, you know, and so we send these resumes out into cyberspace so often the times we just don't know where it's going to land up. 
So then, um, if we, uh, because we give up control, how do we gain, regain control then? Well, we regain control by writing a very carefully crafted resume. And it has a lot to do with building trust with your reader and sending a message that they really want to hear. The most important things that you want to do are focus on those trust elements, focus on the readability of your resume, because if it's too messy or there are too many words, people aren't going to read it. You also want to create talking points so that you can control what questions they might ask you. And you really want to make a quick impression with your resume. Well then, you know, um, and don't you just love my segues for you? How do we build trust in a resume? <laughs> <laughs> well, keep on clicking. You want to build trust with your reader by showing contrast in terms of uh, the type of work that you've done in response to the problems that were there. And we're going to talk later about that in the, in the webinar when we talk about building accomplishment statements. But the most important thing that you want to do just at the basic level to build trust with your reader is make sure that the entire resume is focused on them, not what, not what you want to do, but what they need. You want to use simple words so, that it, so it's easy to read, and you want to show that contrast also with using clean white space. If you have words running across your page, there's, there's nothing to con compare and contrast those words with. You want white space so the eye is allowed to float across the page to exactly the place you want the eye to land. Great, thanks. And readability, I know, is your next point. Readability is really important. You want to be sure that you know ahead of time where you want your reader's eye to go. Again, if you have too much verbiage, you're going to confuse the eye. A lot of what I learned in my program at UCI in the psychology department was about how the brain reacts and responds. For any psych majors on the line, it's a neuropsychology degree, really. And you have to understand what, what's going on in the limbic system when you look at someone's eyeballs or if you look at someone's resume. You want to build that trust so that you can establish a rapport with them, even if, even if your resume is standing in as your voice. So be sure that you don't confuse your reader. Um, you want to make it easy on the eye by having a, a format that's also very simple. You want not just white space, but you want it to make sense when they look at the page. They know what they're looking at. They know if they're reading your job experience or your key competencies or if they, if they, if they want to know what you're looking for. There. They should be able to find very easily where their eyes should go to look for what you're looking for. So you want to have a simple format. Simple format, okay. So you talk about creating talking points. Tell us more about that. Okay, um, we often try to talk about ourselves too much on a resume and describe everything that we have done. And you lose the reader. What if they don't want to hear that? You, what you want to do is you want to just tickle their, their interest with bullet points that are short, not long, that, are, that have lead-in phrases with powerful action verbs instead of you know, describing all the different things that you were involved in. So you really want to be careful about those long sentences. I really don't like any bullet point more than two lines, one line even, if you can. You know, Julie, I have to tell you, we're getting a flurry of questions coming in right now, and I know that you probably will address this a little bit later on, but here are a couple of things that I think are sort of pertinent to these, uh, you know, your, your talking points here. How long should a resume be? Um, uh, I, uh, someone is saying here, it looks like Georgia is saying, you know, I've heard one page, I've heard two page. So you're creating talking points, you're using bullets, you're keeping it short, but how long should it be? That's a great question. I get that question a lot, and, and I think if you ask 100 people about a resume, you're going to get 100 different answers. Here's how I do it, and it seems to work. If you have under five years of experience, just keep it to one page. If you have more than five years of experience and you've been doing some complex work, you've been working in an organization in a, in a complex role, maybe interacting with a lot of different departments, um, the work you're doing affects the bottom line, you can tie numbers and tangible evidence to the type of um, impact that you've had on an organization, then after five or seven years, go ahead and move on to two pages and don't feel like you have to fill the whole, the whole second page. Um, 
Never should you have more than a two-page resume unless you're published, patented, or you're a medical doctor with a lot of, um, you know, television appearances and, and something very unusual would, you know, that would that would that would beg the question of what else have, has this person done. For most people on this call, you're one or two pager, just like me, and probably just like you, Kerman. Great, great. Well, that's very helpful. You know, here comes another question I, I, I've been seeing here. You know, you talked about focusing on simple words. And the question is, well, I work in a very technical field. So, uh, and the people that I'm talking to are also in a technical field. Do I not use those words? It's sort of a shorthand language between us all. So um, I'm a little confused here. The question goes, you know, focus on simple words, but I'm in a very technical field. How would you, how would you counsel me on that? Okay, that's a great question. Um, there are a couple different ways you can do that. Um, Either, I think, is fine. You want to use simple words in describing the situation, but then you want to use the technical words to describe how you implemented the solution. So, for instance, you might say, we saved uh, $50,000 year over year by implementing an ERP strategy designed to bring together the marketing, sales, and distribution function. Okay, I'm making that up off the top of my head. There are technical skills in there that you use to do that, but you described it in simple words. You might then say um, technical, um, you know, might say um, uh, using the following software. Da, da, da. You can list them there, or you can pull them out of the actual experience, job experience entry and create a skills section at the bottom of your resume or even the top if you're an IT person and list them there. But it, it's, it's usually helpful if you tie the actual technical um, ability to the accomplishment that you're talking about. But again, describe it in general using those simple words, then use the technical terms. That's really great advice. You know, you and I were talking before we started our webinar today, and you gave me a did you know fact that I just thought was fascinating. So, did you know what? <laughs> did you know that the most amount of time that you have to capture your reader's eye is at the most part like seven seconds? Seven seconds. Yeah, some people say 15, but I was a recruiter for almost 10 years, and people were lucky to get seven. If it was hard to read, reading a, vol a stack of, of resumes a day, you all, you're only going to read the ones that are easy to read. They're, they're complicated. So only seven seconds? I mean, I put so much time into a resume. I spend weeks and weeks creating my resume, and you're telling me only seven seconds I'm going to have a chance to make a first impression? Like Mark Twain said, I would have written less if I had only had more time. If I had only had more time. Well, again, how do you cram all of that into, you know, a resume? Um, how do you do all of that? <laughs> well, there's a wrong way and there's a right way. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> The wrong way, let's go to the next page. I think All I have right, the wrong, wrong way on way. there. There's the wrong way. Um, the wrong way is talking about yourself and using first person and, and underestimating the experience that you've had, um, not saying enough or not saying too much. This is an example of not saying enough. Um, as a busboy at a restaurant for a college job, for those of you new grads, if you write that you cleared tables, folded napkin, and made sure that the water glasses were full, which I have seen a lot on a resume, you're not going to get a job. You need to really take a look at what the skills were behind that experience and talk about that. I was responsible for um, helping smooth daily operations of a restaurant. I was I supported the um, the the lead servers with client with customer service. I reduced efficiencies between the kitchen and the wait staff. I mean, there are lots of different things that you can talk about, different ways you can talk about your experience that will transfer directly into the workplace. You know, Julie, I see a lot of resumes myself here at the university. When I first looked at this, you know, the thing that struck me was that the objective. I am seeking a company, <laughs> and it just seems like, you know, this person, is uh, John, is just saying, you know, what they want as opposed to how they can help. I mean, that's my very first impression with this particular resume here. But I think you make a really good point, is that um, it needs to be much more focused and um, – yeah, you know, and we have a lot of students and people on the call right now that don't have a lot of experience. Yeah. So if we start to look at this and create the wrong way into the right way, what would your first suggestions be? Well, go back to the basics that we talked about in the very beginning of the webinar, Kerwin. You want to be sure that you're focusing on them. 
And you want to be sure that that first third of, of the first page is really a grabber. People will know after they've glanced at the top third of your resume whether they want to put it in the I'll come back to it pile or not. And just like any sale, you have to know what you're selling. And, and when you submit a resume, what you're trying to get from your reader is you're trying to get them to put you in the I'll get back to it pile. You're not trying to get them to hire you. You just want them to go back to it and read it further. So I think you make a really good point there that the purpose of a resume is to get more interest or to have them want to know who you actually are. Exactly. And we do this by having a very clear objective, uh, creating a professional summary, and the key competencies. All of these three building blocks will fit into the first third and capture your reader's eye if you follow a nice, simple format. And I have a nice, simple format I, I'm happy to share with you guys today. Great. I can't wait to see it. You know, we do have one question that I think is germane for where we are right now. Should you put your address on the resume? Should you add your LinkedIn address to your resume? Do I put my Facebook link in there? How much is too much, and what should I really focus on? Um, you know, I, again, I think if you ask 100 different resume uh, writers or career counselors this, you're going to get 100 different answers. Me personally, I, don't, I think it's a waste of space to put LinkedIn on because all they have to do is Google you and LinkedIn's going to pop you up on the top of the search. Facebook, stay away from Facebook. It, it, you don't want people looking at your Facebook page. F Facebook is really uh, widely accepted that it's personal, not business, whereas LinkedIn is business, not personal. Um, let's see, your address. Um, I think it's important to, at the very least, have the city so that people know where you reside, and it gives an indication of uh, the general um, metropolitan area that you would accept a job in. So um, keep it uncluttered. You want to keep it very uncluttered. Great. Let's go to your building blocks now, because I know you have a couple of building blocks here. So let's look at the objective. The objective is, is something that... Um, that you want to put at the top that is not necessarily exactly the job title that you're seeking, but captures a bucket of job titles that would be relevant to the type of work that you want to do. Um, if you bold it and put it in 14-point font and center it at the top of your page, then you're going to be able to stand out as somebody who would be able to do the job that maybe the reader is looking for. So, for example, well, I have something on, I'll show you on the, when we get to the right way example. Oh, all You'll right, see. okay. So let's move on to building block num number two. Yeah. Okay, the professional summary. Um, I'm a real stickler for the professional summary. I have developed over the years a formula. I think everything in life is easier with a theory or a formula attached to it. So here you go. Um, you want to have a three-sentence, in my opinion, a three-sentence professional summary. The first sentence is the scope of the work that you've done or the scope of your experience. You want to show the breadth. You want to show the range of what you have to offer. The next sentence is your particular expertise. You really want to drill down for them and show them why they should hire you. And then the third sentence should be your style statement. And for those of you in the audience who raised your hand having five or more years of experience, this is really important for you. You want to show if you're detail-oriented or a really independent worker or somebody who really likes to work on teams or somebody who's totally passionate about efficiencies in the workplace. If you have under five years of experience, you may not want to include your style. You may want to actually um, replace the, the third sentence with what you're looking for, like a currently seeking dot, 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 so that, so that the, um, the hiring manager knows what this young, young professional is really looking for. Building block number three. Building block number three, are, this is really important. These are the key competencies. These are short, teeny, tiny, micro sound bites of the type of skills that you will deliver. Um, I like for people over five years of experience to have eight and under five years of experience to have six. Very short bullet points right underneath your professional summary. They quickly show your reader what you offer. They can be hard skills. They can be soft skills. It doesn't matter. Maybe you're just highly effective because you really are just a highly organized person. If if it's true, put it up there. Don't say organized because you don't have anything else to say because everybody's kind of organized. But if that's the secret sauce that makes you successful in things, definitely put it up there. Some examples of hard skills are like Excel or certain IT skills. Um, 
some, what about um, client service skills? That's another soft skill that's very, very, very in high demand and very transferable. You want to try to make them unique to the industry that you're looking into, and you want them to catch the eye of your prospective employer. Again, make it easy on them. If you don't know what they're looking for, go look up different resumes and job descriptions related to the role that you're looking for, and pull down some of the bullet points, some of the key terms into your bullet points that match. You know, I have another question here. I'm not quite sure exactly what it all means, but is it okay to have your logo on a resume, a colored icon of some sort? So I'm not really quite sure if I understand the question completely. Would this be someone who, who started their own business and they have a logo? Or um, I'm not aware if younger people or people have their own personal logos or not, but there is the question for you. Well, it's not very traditional, but I have seen a few resumes that have the corporate logo to the left mar on the left-hand margin. I'm not a huge fan, just me personally. I'm a traditionalist. I don't like people to get cute with serious stuff. Um, so if you get a hiring manager like me, I'm probably going to throw it away. I might look at it and say, oh, that's pretty, but I'm not going to take it seriously. Um, you might find some younger hiring managers who only want to see the visuals. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a game. I would say that having a visual resume with uh, you know, everything summarized on one page, with the, with the visual or the company logo to the left would be a great marketing tool for face-to-face -face engagements like networking events and UCI functions. And here's a follow-up question. How about a photograph? No. No. That was very clear. Sorry. All right. Building block number four. Okay. The accomplishment statements. There are two types of resumes in general. There's the experience-oriented resume and the accomplishment-oriented resume. Nowadays, people want to know results. They don't care what you've done. They want to know the impact that it had. So you want to build trust with your reader by putting numbers, tangible examples, time, numbers, amounts, um, savings. Quantify, quantify, quantify from six months to three months. Figure out a way to quantify and put a tangible example of something that you've accomplished for an organization, even if it's waiting tables. There was a number of tables and there was a number of turns, and we, you need to put that in. And we know that restaurants can get quite bus bu busy at oh, night. Wow. So, I mean, yeah. I, you know, when I go out, I am, I am amazed at the skill of people who are handling 20 tables in one night. I, I mean, I think that's a really a, a great project management skill. It is, and it's multitasking, and people need it. So we talked about the wrong way, mm -hmm. so now I can show everybody here the right way. Wow, this is a really a big difference here. But talk us through this, please. Sure. Um, so John now has switched careers. He's not no longer a busboy. He's a college grad with a year or two of social media experience, and he really wants to go into producing events using so social media and doing, um, incorporating some field marketing. So I think you get that just from looking at his headline, social media and production associate. He'd take anything in that bucket. Um, you can see, I didn't point out in the wrong way example, but a lot of you probably saw his earlier email address, Murphy555 or whatever it was. Get a professional email address at gmail, at yahoo, or at me.com. It's okay to have one for fun, but you need to get a professional email address. You can see his uh, professional summary is three sentences. In general, his breadth statement is that, or excuse me, his scope statement is that he's a social media expert with experience working in field marketing, promotions, and event management. And he plugs in that he's been with one of the largest entertainment brands. You want them to know that. You've got to speak up for yourself. Then we go into his particular expertise. His second statement says that he's really good at conceptualizing, again, pulling that skill in, what the client needs, figuring out the strategy to do it, and getting it done. So he's really your go-to guy, and we're telling the reader that. They get that loud and clear. And then since he's not got five years or more, we went with currently seeking. And what, what he'd really like is a role in social media or production. And he's really focused on using that social media to drive client engagement. So um, that's more his style, and you see there executing amazing events. So we did, we did pu pull in a little bit of his style. Then his key competencies, we pulled eight together because we had eight, because he does have actually, from his internships, uh, quite a bit of experience, cumulative experience. And all of these relate to the type of work that he wants to do. So I think in this first third, we get a quick, a good snapshot of what, what John's got to offer. You know, and it's visually appealing, and I can get it right off the bat. I mean, seeing social media production associate there really tells me a lot. And, and it helps me uh, as a hiring manager to sort of already begin to categorize him and, and, and what his strengths are. He's for hire. 
I'm sorry? He's for hire. He's for hire. I'm moving to the next time. <laughs> I know we have a lot of questions here coming up. You know, I'm seeing we have several questions right now under the Q&A. Let me please remind all of our, uh, all of our attendees today. Um, it's a little bit easier for us if we have uh, your questions in our chat box. I'm just now finding some of the Q&A questions here. So we will start to go through some of these. Uh, can you please be sure to explain lead-in phrases? Absolutely. Um, I, I didn't put an example in. I wish I had, so try to follow me. Grab a really powerful action verb like reduced, developed, designed, created, conceptualized, implemented, and then say what it was. Just three or four words. Implemented an innovative strategy. Implemented a, implemented a time-saving strategy. That would be a lead-in statement or a lead-in phrase. Next question is, should you have your education and softwares that you've mastered on the first page or the second page? You know, if you're looking for your first job, you want to put your education right up front. So my, my example of the right way would be tweaked. I wasn't really sure which way to go because some people, you know, we have quite a variety of job seekers in the crowd today. But if you are, you know, in your, looking for your first or second job, put your education right up front underneath your professional summary um, or, or under your, your key competencies, depending on, um, you know, what looks more pleasing on the eye. And then regarding software, if you are an IT person, a hardcore programmer, um, IT person, then, yeah, you're going to want to put your software category. You're going to want to create a category for software and just list those keywords. Next question, I have more than 10 years of experience but have been out of work of my field for eight years, staying home as a mom. How do you suggest I deal with this? Grab it by the horns. They're going to be lucky to have you, and they need to know that you're reentering the marketplace with a vengeance, and they better take a look at you first because you're going to get snatched up. I would say, you know, eight years of experience, or however many years of, 10 years of experience with blah, 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 putting those hard skills in there, currently seeking um, reentry into the workplace, looking for a position in blah, 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 and I would wear that on your sleeve and talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Don't let anyone hold it against you. For online job submissions, is an objective really necessary? On most websites, you generally are applying for a specific single job. Um, yeah, I, that's a really good question. Don't trust what you read. Um, often, job uh, hiring managers will put a job up on a board, post a job that's kind of what they want but they're not really sure what they want. I'm sure everybody, including me probably, has submitted for a job and never heard anything back. And, or, or submit, you know, the, the job posting goes up and two days later it goes down and nobody ever hears anything and nobody gets hired. Sometimes they just want to take a look and see what's out there. So you want to be sure that you're representing yourself for who you really are, not folding yourself around what you think they want to hear. You know, you, here's another question that sort of follows up on that. Um, it's a painful fact. How to get your resume to the hiring manager? HR, human resources, sometimes scans your resume and throws it in the trash before the manager even has a chance to look at it. So how do I know that it's getting to the right people? That's, oh, that's, we could have a whole other webinar on that one. Um, I have a sales background, and I firmly believe that a job seeker should spend some time developing some sales skills. Um, you want to be sure that you are doing everything you can to put yourself in contact or close contact with a hiring manager. I like to divert HR, unless I know an HR person face-to-face. -face. Young people, Listen to me. Get your LinkedIn profile humming. LinkedIn is one of the best job-seeking tools there, there are. They have new advancements left and right every single day. You've got to get in there and use some of the tools that they have. Um, I'm a big believer in the old-school approach. I cold call um, a, a, a direct mail hit on a flat, long manila envelope, not folded up, just a, with a handwritten note attached to it. Anything you can do to get it on the hiring manager's desk. And again, LinkedIn will get you closer and closer to it. Somebody can introduce you to somebody. You know, the questions are coming in fast and furious. Yeah. Uh, this is really great to see all of this. Where do you put volunteer work on a resume? Should I leave it off? No. Volunteer work is extremely important. At the end, after your education or for 
um, younger people, younger uh, emerging professionals who have their education up front at the end of your job, job experience. You want to have a category with other technical profession, proficiencies or activities and awards, but you also want to have volunteer or affiliations. And the reason that that's important is it shows that you are um, involved in your community, that you're doing something with your time, that you're making a difference, that you have energy. You always want to play up your energy and your youthfulness when you're looking for a job. Even if you've got 30 years of experience, you play up your youthfulness? Absolutely. That's the only way to do it. Because I have a question here right now was, you know, should I put the year that I graduated from school, which was many, many years ago, or, you know, working in my first jobs, you know, in the 70s or 80s, does that fall off? I mean, I feel like, as the question goes, I've got a lot of experience. So what do I choose to leave off and what do I put on? Well, um, it can get really tricky, but as a rule of thumb, it's widely accepted by hiring managers that they only want to see the most recent 10 years. Um, I don't usually encourage people who've been working for several years to put their um, year of college graduation. It just isn't relevant because if you have enough experience, if you have 20 or 30 years of experience, your college degree was a base for something that you've built, but what you've built is really your base, and so that's what you want to highlight. So just the, ten, the most recent 10 years. Here's another really good question. I have been an entrepreneur for the last 12 years, but I'm now looking for a job. How should I write it on my CV or on my resume? Is it a problem to have been self-employed? I don't think so, but I'm an entrepreneur. So, I, again, I think that's one of those things that if you feel like it's a liability, you've got to figure out a way to, to overcome it. So, you know, take a, take a pro and con, um, write down entrepreneur for 12 years, what are the cons, what, how does that look bad, and then write how does it look good, and figure out a way to overcome that liability. Again, I don't think it's a liability. Um, I think it's really important. It shows that you were able to be successful as an entrepreneur for 12 years and that you can self-start. There's a lot in that. And, and if you are trying to uh, apply to an entrepreneurial organization, it's probably going to be more well-received. Always consider your source. Great. Well, these are really great questions, and I'm going to tell everybody, sure please are. keep your questions coming in here. We'll, we'll keep moving forward in our, in our webinar here. Um, so, Julie, you talk about grabbing someone's attention. You, I know you have some key takeaways here. Well, I was going to um, actually, I, I didn't know if there was a way to query the, um, the audience on what their key takeaways were, but if I were to put two or three out, I would say make it readable. Make it easy on the eye, aesthetically pleasing. Short, simple phrases, no jargon, no industry you know, terminology. You want to keep it simple. And the other thing is, is you want the format to be lovely. You want to, you're just trying to get to the I'll look at it again pile. Great. Well, I'll keep the line open. We're going to move forward with our rest of our webinar here, but I certainly want to say right now before we get too far that, Julie, you have been a pleasure to have here today, and we're so glad to have you. And again, if you have any questions directly for Julie, she's graciously allowed her email address and phone number to be posted on the webinar. We'll also come to a few other things at the very end about contact information and follow-up. But um, here is Julie's email address and her phone number, and I think you might welcome some people giving you a call. Absolutely. So I, I want to uh, follow up on some last things here. You know, with UC Irvine alumni, we have the Ant Eater Network. And did you know that the Ant Eater Network is 140,000 people strong? across the nation, and I know we have some alumni people here with us in our office today across the world. So I think that's very amazing that we have that large of an alumni network there, and we know it's all about networking. And the Alumni Association really is focused on fostering continuing opportunities by connecting you one to another. Um, and uh, by using the resources of the university through a variety of communications and events aimed at elevating you, helping you leverage the Anteater Network, and delivering relevance to your everyday life. I've had a question here to please put Julie's contact information up again, so I'm going to put this slide back up. And it is reiterated in our very last slide as we come to close here. So there it is, folks. Julie at julielacroix.com, 
keep those questions coming in. So again, tapping into the Anteater Network, the Anteater Network has a variety of events and mixers, career web webinars such as this one here. For those of you who attended our first webinar in August, this is our second webinar, and we have a couple of other webinars coming up in December. Uh, and we'll have more information about that in just a moment. And if you like this, if you find these webinars useful, please let us know, because then we will be able to continue in the future with, with them. You know, I think a very interesting and very crucial point here is that there are over 11,000 members on the Anteater Network exclusive LinkedIn group, and that's a very impressive number. That if you're a member of the Anteater Network, you're entitled to discounts on UC Irvine extension courses. You know, sometimes if you've been in a career for a while or, or need to update your skills or you're looking for a career change, uh, you know, you can come to UC Irvine Extension and we can help you retool or uh, modify your skills or update your credentials in any way as you move forward. UC Library Access and Book Borrowing, 20% discount off of UCI Career Center Alumni Compass and One Pass Services, and of course, discounts on Kaplan courses here. You know, I wanted to tell you right off the bat here that um, our next webinars, we have one webinar on December 4th, which is going to be on interviewing, and we have a second webinar on Wednesday, December 12th, on salary negotiations. And if you'd like to RSVP for those, you can go to www.extension.uci.edu forward slash events. I'll repeat that when we get a little farther into our webinar here. We're very excited to know that on January 12, 2013, which is a Saturday, the new Newkirk Alumni Center is going to be open here on campus. It's a beautiful building. The staff is getting ready to move in next week, and it's going to be a wonderful place for everyone to come to and be able to network together, a place to connect with people for social events, and it's a beautiful building, and I know that you're going to enjoy that a lot. Real quickly, uh, again, we mentioned discounts on UC Irvine Extension courses and programs. For those of you who don't know, UC Irvine Extension, we are the official continuing education division of UCI, and we have more than 60 certificates and specialized studies programs to choose from on campus, online, very practically oriented with industry applicable courses. Again, accredited UC approved curriculum can be customized. And we have found that many people, after they've been out of school for a while, they find great value in coming back to extension. Again, you get a discount and updating your skills, uh, finding new information, or tweaking your background if you want to go into a new direction. This webinar has also been sponsored in part by the UC Irvine Career Center, providing access and opportunities to all UCI students and alumni. Zotlink job searches, graduate school fairs annually, and over 300 featured employers for on-campus recruiting and four, count them, four annual uh, career fairs. So a lot of opportunities and resources for you here at UCI. So in closing, I'm going to leave this slide up a little bit more uh, as we have some more questions coming in. We're coming close to our time today uh, to complete, but uh, the UC Irvine Alumni Association phone number and addresses. Julie, again, let's get that phone number out there and the email for Julie. Again, UC Irvine Extension, we are here to help you, and of course, the UC Irvine Career Center. So this concludes the formal part of our webinar today. I'm going to hold the lines open. If you have more questions, please send them in on the chat box. And we'll hold here for a couple more minutes. We want to make sure that all of your questions have been addressed and that you're coming away today with having everything explained to you that you need to excel and have success in your career.
I'll give you some time to type in the chat box if you have more questions. You know, I'll also say, um, if you don't have any questions, we don't need to stay online just to stay online. We can, um, you know, log off at a certain point. Again, the webinar is being recorded, has been recorded, and will be sent to you at a later date. We'll also have the webinar posted on the Extension website and the UCI Alumni website, and I think also on the Career Center's website. Again, you can contact us, and we're more than happy to help you. You know, here is a question. I unfortunately don't know the answer myself, but maybe one of my colleagues knows. When is the next career uh, fair here on campus? Does anyone in our in our in our um, in, in, in our room right here know when the co next career fair is? January twenty fourth is the internship and career. Fair. January twenty fourth. At what time is that? And I guess you can go to the UC Irvine Career Center website right there and get more information about that. I guess I've got a couple of questions coming in right now. If a person has more than 10 years of experience, where should he or she list their education on the, web, on the resume, at the end or at the beginning? Um, it depends. Usually I put a heading uh, as, as one of the very last categories, so the, the, the category directly beneath the end of your professional experience, but before any other categories like skills or affiliations or volunteer work. So you want it to be right after your professional experience. Um, if you have a recent MBA or a recent master's in organizational development, you're going to want to put it right out there in your scope statement. You're not going to want to put a whole category, but you might say, MBA with 10 plus years of experience in financial accounting, blah, 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 blah. So um, find a way to massage it in so that they can get the scope of what you, what you do right up front. Otherwise, just in a nice category below the professional experience. Here's a question. I worked on multiple projects. With the newest, should the newest experience be at the top or at the bottom? And the same for education if I have several different degrees. I uh, worked on multiple projects. The new experience should multiple be multiple projects. Oh yeah, you want to do reverse chronological order. I think that's the question. So the most recent experience goes at the top. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is there an appropriate way to follow up after sending in a resume? So many ads say not to call. So often there's no name and email address to follow up. Any, any advice or suggestions? Um. Well, me personally, I'm sorry, but I think if you respond to a job ad, you're just asking for competition. My style is to come up with a target list of companies that you would like to work for because you're, they have something compelling to you. Maybe they are in an industry that you're passionate about or just, just have been interested in for a long time. Maybe it's an up-and-coming industry that you'd like to be a part of. Um, make a direct hit to those companies. Chances are not everybody's going to be applying to them. And Everybody needs to hire somebody. Don't let don't just because they don't have something on their website doesn't mean they're not looking. You know, I think you make a really good point as well because I know in the many years that I've done work with, with people, there's a there's a fine line between being persistent and a nudge. Yeah. Can can you talk about that a little bit? You know, when sure. do you know you're being a nudge, um, and you're very enthusiastic about working for for the company. Yeah, I think um, in a big company, you're going to be a nudge. <laughs> in a smaller company, they might actually appreciate uh, some contact from you. I always like a handwritten note. Again, I'm old school, um, but I think that you stand out that way. Um, call them on a Wednesday after 10 o'clock, but before noon. Um, if you must, make it a Tuesday, but I prefer Wednesday. And then call them again the following Tuesday. If you haven't heard anything back by then, just let it go and move on. Okay. You know, there's a question here about can anyone attend the career fair at UC Irvine? That is for students and alumni of UCI, I believe. I, I believe uh, we're checking on that right right now. I think it's for students. There's going to be an alumni career fair in okay. the summer. Okay, great. Thanks so so much. Okay, uh, let's see a couple of other really good questions coming in right now. Does Julie have any resources, books, people, blogs, and websites that you would recommend for job searches? Um, I'll give you one of each. Books, um, believe it or not, I've never read What Color Is Your Parachute? I can't believe it, but I hear it's a fantastic uh, 
program to go through. Um, I know that they also have it for the college grad, um, and Dick Nodell knows what he's doing, um, and that whole crew. So um, people, I mean, I can help you, Kerwin can help you, the Career Center can help you. There are resources uh, that you can find through the UCI Alumni LinkedIn group, um, and I would highly recommend that you take advantage of those. Blogs, um, I would check the Career Center, and I have a blog on my website, julielacroix.com, um, and uh, websites that you can use for job searchers, I'm telling you, it's all on LinkedIn. And don't be afraid to get out there. I mean, to be honest, the, the, the kind of raw reality here is that nobody really owes anybody a job. You kind of have to go out and find it. And um, the best way you can do that is to be in front of people. I looked for my first job during a horrible recession in 93 when Orange County was bankrupt. I spent four or five hours a day in the library looking up SIC codes and through yellow pages. and I got a job, and believe it or not, I got it through playing a game of, you know, caps in my apartment with some friends, but I was constantly talking about work. Who's working and where are you working and who's hiring? And eventually the job will come to you, but you've got to really do the work and put yourself out there. Live on LinkedIn, but don't spend more than two or three hours a day on the computer. Get out there. Go to Panera. Talk to strangers. Use your parents. Use your network. Use whatever you've got and always ask them to introduce you to somebody else. You always want to be widening and expanding. You know, what I've often found to be true as well is that resumes will get you a foot in the door, but people don't hire resumes. No. Nope. They hire people. And they hire people they like. You and really they, want your resume to be an afterthought. And so showing yourself that you're a faith, that you have a personality, you have strength, and you bring something to them, you know, people like to talk to people. And people like to hire people as well. They don't just hire a piece of paper. So the purpose of the resume, and, I, uh, and I'd like your thoughts on this, is to help you make that entree and to qualify you for even being, you know, considered for the position. But that personal touch is always very key. I think you're absolutely right, Kerwin, and a well-crafted cover letter can do that. Oh, great. Here's another question. Um, uh, what if I'm applying for a job in a different industry altogether? For example, I'm switching to, from design to IT. Should I only include skills and info that are relative to that new place, or what about the old skills that I have? That is a great question. Um, there is the theory of abundance, and there is the theory of precision when it comes to resumes, and I subscribe to the theory of precision. So if you are really clear on what you are targeting, you want to design your resume to hit that target. In this case, it sounds like you're going to have to let some of those IT, is it design first and then IT? It was designed into IT. Well, that, the, you know, I'm sorry, but those two actually do go hand in hand. Um, design and creativity is more important in every industry than ever before. There's a great book called A Whole New Mind. For any of you art, or fine arts grads out there who don't think you're ever going to be able to get a job, go read it. You will. You'll get a job. Isn't that by Daniel Pink? I think so, yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful it's book. It's a fantastic And I've heard him speak. Yeah. That for the artistic. Oh, have you? I've heard him speak on several occasions that, you know, uh, uh, innovative thinking and yes. creative thinking are skills that we all need in our continuing evolving world. Yes, and IT needs it desperately because there's so much clutter out there and you really have to differentiate yourself in IT. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these are wonderful questions. Keep them coming in right now. I want to make a statement that the alumni – a career fair hosted at UC Irvine next summer, summer of 2013, is for graduates of all universities. They are invited. And please see career.uci.edu for student career fair information. Here's another really good question. How soon should you send out a thank you note? Can it be an email, or should it be handwritten? Should it be hand-delivered, or is mailing okay? Is it appropriate to use email for a thank you note? Well, this is where you can get really smart, all of you intelligent UCI grads. Um, figure out who your audience is and what generation they're from. If you're being hired by a 25-year-old, you can probably Twitter them. Send them a tweet. But if you're, I mean, I'm 41 going on 42. If I was your hiring manager, me personally, I would want a handwritten note. Um, you want to be really careful that you're, that you're uh, tailoring your communication style to your audience. So 
to me, the best thing to do is to send a quick email either later that day or the next morning, and then also send the handwritten note with a little something cute, a little cartoon from the New Yorker, an, an article on their industry, clip something out that maybe relates to a restaurant that they mentioned when you were in there for an interview, something, something to make yourself stand out. So again, what you're pointing out is to be personable as well. Yeah, you know, be, back to your point. Be personable. I've always found that people want to know who people are. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you're interviewing for job, you know, you spend so much time with this potential person in the future that they want to know who you are a little bit, appropriately so. Mm -hmm. Here's another really good question. It's about bolding and using italics in the body of a resume. Should they be bold? Should you use plain text? How about italics? Uh, I know a lot of resumes are scanned electronically by systems there. So um, should it okay. be bolded or, or okay. how do I judiciously use bolding, italicized, and different fonts? Okay, so for, you know, Orange County, I'm assuming most people on this call are from Orange County. Orange County is an, is an industry of small businesses. We really have an economy of small to mid-sized businesses, 50 to $150 million in revenues. A lot of these companies don't have resume scanners. Some do, but at the lower end, they don't. For those people who want to work for larger companies, um, you can definitely uh, assume that they have scanners. And so the least amount of formatting, the better. No text boxes. Um, you can use bullet points, but don't do anything fancy with them because they will get kicked out by the reader. Um, italicize is fine. Um, bold is fine. I think bold is a very good strategic tool on a resume to draw the eye where you want the eye to go. Um, but just be, avoid text boxes. Be, be careful with too much formatting. You know, I agree with you completely that use appropriately and judicious, judiciously mm -hmm. that bold can really add emphasis for where you want them to go. Exactly. You want their eye to go. You get control. <laughs> ah, there's you that control, control the again. eye. There's that control again. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming close to the end of our webinar now. I'm going to hang on for just another minute or two for any last-minute typing for questions. Again, it has been our pleasure to have you here today, and such a special thanks to Julie for this wonderful information. So uh, any other thing? Oh, here comes another question here. We'll stay until you're all answered. Um, let me read this question first, please. What is Would it be okay if you show up in person at the place where you'd like to work after seeing a job posted online by that company instead of submitting an email? Well, Miriam's my kind of girl. I would hire her, but that's my style. I, I have a sales bent towards me, I think having had a background in business development, and I'm kind of the eager beaver, you know, early bird gets the worm kind of person anyhow. So, Miriam, if you want to show up with donuts, go for it, girl. I think, I think they're <laughs> going to look at you. And I, and I actually promise that I know somebody who in the middle of the down economy in like mid-year 2010 at the senior level walked into Mazda for a senior marketing position with a 12-pack of donuts, and he got the job. And he just cold called them like that, totally old school. Go old school, you guys. But it my works. recommendation is if you're bringing donuts, make sure to stop by Julie's house first. <laughs> one, one with a donut. coffee. All right. Uh, okay, no, the question, we, we have a question here about formatting. And there was something, I think, that scrolled up about GPA on the, web, on the resume. I'm sorry. I don't remember on GPA. I thought I saw the word GPA come through, but I can talk to that really quickly if you okay, want. Okay. Yes, please do. Okay. Um, if you have uh, just a few years of experience, or it's your entry level, again, those five years and below, especially for entry level, you're probably going to want to put your GPA on there. If you're looking for a sales position or something a little softer, if you're going into counseling, then your GPA isn't going to be as important. But if you're Going into a competitive industry in a competitive role, um, using competitive skills, then your GPA is going to be important. Again, the bigger the company you're applying to, the more competitive it's going to be and the more crowded it's going to be. Don't lose sight of what's offered right here in our backyard in Orange County. We have so many companies with 15 to 50 employees that are really, really worth working for, and they're not going to look at the GPA as much. You know, and I agree with you on that as well because you're also wanting to point out the fact that you're coming from UC Irvine. 
UC Irvine is a wonderful institution, highly regarded in our community, well known across the state, across the country, of course. University of California brand identity is very significant there. And to have a good education from UCI is really a plus. It is. There's, a, there's a wonderful, uh, just to to build on that, Kerwin, if you go to linkedin.com backslash alumni, that's a great little hidden trick on LinkedIn, and um, you can find where all the, I'm on there, all the UCI alumni from the years that you were at school, you can filter by anything. It's a wonderful way to reach people. That's great. Another question about formatting, uh, do I use a center format, do I use justification, do I uh, use columns, or uh, okay. how, how creative can I get? Not too creative. You don't want to get too cute. Um, columns, I believe, are kind of like text boxes where they're going to get kicked out. Um, I personally prefer the center format that, that I presented to you. I believe it's the most appealing on the eye. Maybe I like it because it's what I have kind of migrated to over the years. It's kind of a design that I created after working with and building and reading thousands of resumes. Um, I've seen some very nicely written IT resumes that are left justified. I think that the left justify looks really good on a one-page resume, but for a two-page resume, I like my style of that first third where you can really pull the meat up to the top. You just roll the really important things up to the top. Great, great. A couple more minutes. We have four more minutes. I want to keep us to our time commitment today. I currently have 12.26 p.m. in the afternoon here. Uh, we'll hold on for another minute or two for any last-minute questions that you might have for our expert, Julie, today. Well, I do not seem to be seeing any more questions coming in, so on behalf of UC Irvine, UC Irvine Alumni Association, uh, Anteater Network, UC Irvine Career Center, UC Irvine Extension, and Julie, we'd all like to thank you for being here today for this webinar, and we hope that you have found it to be useful and of value. And again, for more information, there are a number of different contact informations here, phone numbers and, and web addresses here, email addresses. So please, we'd love to hear from you, particularly if you have suggestions for future webinars. So again, once more, a big round of anteater applause to Julie for such a fantastic job today. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much, and good day, everyone.